Hello everyone, and welcome to Sweet History Tea, a channel full of random facts and lots of sparkles. Before we get into the video, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. Some of the names and words in this video will be said in a somewhat choppy way. For those who do not know, I use a text-to-speech program for my videos. While I try to make the program say words as correctly as possible, Sometimes my efforts do not always work and the program will continue to say certain names and words incorrectly. I am sorry for the inconvenience and thank you for understanding. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. The name Romanov, once associated with a mighty royal dynasty, has become a name associated with tragedy in the last century. Eighteen rulers of Russia were from this dynasty and the country would see social and political changes under each czar. Despite the dynasty giving the world 18 monarchs, the most famous of this family is Tsar Nicholas II, the last czar of Russia. This is not just the story of Nicholas and his family, it is also the story of the end of the 300 years of Romanov rule. Nicholas Alexandrovich Romanov was born on May 18, 1868 at the Alexander Palace and was the first child born to the future Tsar Alexander III and his Danish wife, Maria Fyodorovna. Nicholas would be followed by five more siblings, with one dying in infancy. Maria Fyodorovna tried to give her children a close-knit family life, similar to how she had been raised in Denmark. Alexander helped shape the young Nicholas's views on autocracy and religion. Despite being in the direct line of succession for the Russian throne, Alexander did not teach the young Nicholas how to properly deal with affairs of state. The young boy was educated by a private tutor named Konstantin Pobedonostsev. Nicholas was very well-versed in history and foreign languages, but struggled with his lessons in economics and politics. The life of Nicholas would be changed forever in the early spring of 1881 after the death of his grandfather, Tsar Alexander II. On March 13, 1881, Tsar Alexander II was killed after a bomb exploded while he was traveling in St. Petersburg. The young Nicholas, a boy just 13 years of age, became the Tsarevich after his father became Tsar Alexander III. When Nicholas turned 19, he joined the army and served in it for about three years. He would achieve the rank of colonel in the Russian military. After his military service, Nicholas would tour parts of Europe and Asia. In 1891, Nicholas would get a dragon tattoo while visiting Japan. He would also show interest in traditional crafts and even purchased an ornamental hairpin for a Japanese girl that was nearby. However, this diplomatic trip would not go according to plan. On May 11, 1891, Nicholas was on his way back to Kyoto after a day trip to Lake Biwa. Nicholas was attacked by a young man named Suda Sanzo, who swung a saber at Nicholas. Nicholas's cousin, Prince George of Greece and Denmark, would save his life. Two rickshaw drivers would pin the would-be killer to the ground, while Nicholas had a 9-centimeter-long scar on his face. After the attempted murder, Emperor Meiji ordered that a small group of Japanese princes accompany Nicholas, just to be safe. A Faberge egg called the Memory of Azov was made for Tsar Alexander III as an Easter gift to his wife, Maria Fyodorovna. The egg was made to commemorate the voyage of Nicholas and his brother, Grand Duke George, to the Far East. The egg was made from a deep green bloodstone, another name for heliotrope jasper. It is decorated with stunning gold Rococo-style scrolls, dazzling gold flowers, and many diamonds. The bezel and clasp of the egg have diamonds and a ruby. Inside of the egg is a green velvet material and a miniature replica of the Imperial Russian state cruiser, the Pamiatazova. The miniature boat is made with red and yellow gold, diamonds for the windows, and the water is made with an aquamarine. Years prior, in 1884, a fateful encounter at a wedding would change the course of history. Princess Elizabeth of Hesse and by Rhine, was getting married to Nicholas's uncle, Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich. The 19-year-old bride had a 12-year-old sister named Alex. Nicholas was 16 years old at the time of his first meeting with Alex. Over the years, the pair would meet each other again. Nicholas, now a man in his early 20s, had to settle down and find a suitable wife, and Alex came to mind. However, 
The German princess was not quick to accept the offer of marriage from one of the most eligible bachelors in Europe. Alex was a Lutheran, and in order to marry the heir to the Russian throne, she would have had to convert to Russian Orthodoxy. Alex kept her faith close to her heart, so she declined Nicholas. In the book, Queen Victoria's Matchmaking by Deborah Cadbury, there is a passage that recounts a letter Nicholas received from Alex. It read, It grieves me terribly and makes me very unhappy. I have tried to look at it in every light that is possible but I always return to one thing. I cannot do it against my conscience. You, dear Nikki, who have also such a strong belief, will understand me. We are only torturing ourselves about something impossible and it would not be a kindness to let you go on having vain hopes, which will never be realized. Goodbye my darling Nikki. Nicholas was heartbroken. In his diary, he wrote, All my hopes are shattered by this implacable obstacle. In April of 1894, Nicholas made his way towards Coburg, and he wanted to be able to speak to Alex. Once he arrived, Alex's sister Elizabeth arranged for the couple to meet. When Nicholas saw the young German princess, he noticed that she had become noticeably prettier, but looking extremely sad. Nicholas tried to explain to Alex how he felt, but she wept and replied in a whisper, No, I cannot. He waited until Alex had calmed down before he left her, feeling that his efforts had come to nothing. Kaiser Wilhelm II was a cousin to Alex, and he believed that blood relations could help with politics. The Kaiser took Nicholas in hand, and said that Nicholas must ask again for Alex more forcefully. He told Nicholas to appear more confident and in charge, flowers were even proposed as a romantic gesture. The Kaiser then brought his cousin Alex to the house where Nicholas was staying. This time, Alex would say yes to darling Nikki's proposal. In 1894, the health of the 49-year-old Tsar was beginning to take a turn for the worse. Tsar Alexander III had developed nephritis, a terminal kidney disease. As the illness continued, the newly engaged Alex went to the bedside of her future father-in-law to receive his blessings for the marriage on October 21. A little over a week later, on November 1, 1894, Tsar Alexander III died and the 26-year-old Nikki was now Tsar Nicholas II. Nicholas said, I am not ready to be Tsar. I know nothing of the business of ruling. The Tsar was buried on November 18, 1894. The wedding of Nicholas and Alexandra would take place less than a week later on November 26, 1894. Nicholas and his German fiancé, now known as Alexandra Fyodorovna were married in a magnificent wedding ceremony. The couple were married on the birthday of Nicholas's mother, Maria Fyodorovna. In the Queen Victoria's matchmaking book that was mentioned earlier, the book also lists a passage about Alexandra and how she said that her wedding felt like an extension of the funeral of Tsar Alexander III. The coronation of the Tsar would take place in May of 1896. A few days later, events celebrating the coronation went horribly wrong. Around 400,000 people were part of the crowd. The crowd began to turn into a stampede and order was being lost. People were crushed with the death toll estimated around 1,389 people with more than 900 people injured. The new Tsar and Tsarina saw the carts containing the dead bodies of Russian people, and Nicholas recorded his thoughts in his diary. He wrote, The news had left me a disgusting impression. Nicholas was horrified by the event, and called it a great sin. A ball was held in his honor and Nicholas went against his better judgment and went on to the ball after listening to diplomatic advisors who told him not to offend the French. Li Hongzheng, a Chinese imperial commissioner, remarked that a Chinese emperor would not have attended the ball. Sergei Witt, a finance minister, wrote that, however, his majesty left the ball soon. Evidently, the catastrophe gave him a strong impression. Witt also said that if the choice was left to Nicholas alone, all of the festivities would have been cancelled. The families of the victims were given financial compensation. Nicholas and Alexandra went to the hospital where the injured victims were being treated. Nicholas was in genuine distress over what had happened with the crowds. 
Some saw these tragedies happening so soon after the coronation to be a bad omen. A few months prior to the tragic event at the coronation celebrations, a new addition had arrived in the Romanov family. A little girl was born to Nicholas and Alexandra on November 15, 1895. The baby girl was Grand Duchess Olga Nikolaevna. Olga would be joined by three more sisters, Tatiana Nikolaevna, born on June 10, 1897, Maria Nikolaevna, born on June 26, 1899, and Anastasia Nikolaevna, born on June 18, 1901. Despite having four healthy baby girls, known as Atma by their family, the daughters of Nicholas were not able to become rulers of Russia. The couple needed to have a son in order for the Romanov succession to be secured. The prayers of the Russian imperial family for an heir to the throne were finally answered when Alexei Nikolaevich was born on August 12, 1904. At first, the baby boy seemed perfectly healthy, and he was a large baby, weighing 11 pounds at birth. However, the true health of the Tsarevich would become clear. The navel of the baby started to bleed, but would not stop or clot. It was clear that the heir to the Russian throne was born with hemophilia, which he inherited through Alexandra. Her mother was Princess Alice of the United Kingdom, one of the daughters of Queen Victoria. One of Queen Victoria's sons, Leopold who died in 1884, also had the disease. The disease of the Tsarevich was kept secret, and only close family and staff members were made aware of Alexei's condition. Alexei's parents became extremely protective of the boy, trying to make sure that the boy was not injured. The slightest bump or cut could have possibly killed him. One time Alexei was not allowed by his mother to ride a bike. The boy replied, why can other boys have everything and I nothing? Men were even hired to carry the young boy around. The family as a whole was very close-knit, and Nicholas adored his wife and children. He was a devoted family man. Perhaps if Nicholas had been the second or third-born son, he may have lived quietly with his family in the countryside. The personalities of the five Romanov siblings were very different. Olga enjoyed studying, was intelligent, compassionate, and was musically gifted. Tatiana was elegant, practical, a natural leader, and was interested in fashion. Maria was kind, was talented at drawing, but was uninterested in her schoolwork. Anastasia was the family trickster. She was energetic, enjoyed climbing trees, and was less concerned about how she looked compared to her sisters. Alexei was close to his four elder sisters, and he was an adventurous child. Nicholas also had good relationships with all of his children. When he was ill, little Maria would kiss a picture of her father. Olga confided in her father whenever they went on walks. Tatiana was close to her father and had much in common with him. Anastasia was called Little Mischief. Alexei also had a good relationship with his father, and he was the only person he would listen to. When Alexei threw the parasol of a young girl into a river, Nicholas scolded his son, that is not the way for a gentleman to behave to a lady, he said. The children of the imperial family were raised as simply as possible. They would sleep on cots, took cold baths in the morning, and were expected to tidy up after themselves and keep their rooms in order. The children were encouraged to do needlework and sell it at charity events. Nicholas and Alexandra hoped for some sort of cure or treatment for their sick son, and in 1908, the con man known as Gregory Rasputin was called to help aid a bleeding attack of Alexei's. Rasputin took advantage of a mother and father looking for a way to help treat their sick child, and he had a powerful hold on the family. His influence would come to an end after Rasputin was killed at the age of 47 on December 30, 1916 by a group of individuals led by Prince Felix Yusupov, who was married to the daughter of Nicholas's sister, Grand Duchess Xenia Alexandrovna. Nicholas was a brilliant family man, but not the greatest czar and made many poor choices as leader. His father did not properly train him to rule over the country, and perhaps if he had, the reign of Nicholas would have been different. In 1904, Russia and Japan went to war due to complex politics. 
The effects of the 1905 defeat from this war grew into a flame that sparked the 1905 Russian Revolution. In October of 1905, Nicholas would sign a manifesto that promised the Russian people freedom of speech, of association, of assembly, the right to elect deputies to the State Duma, sanctity of the home, personal immunity, and the liberty of conscience. These were things that would slowly be taken away under the communists in the Soviet Union. In 1907, Russia would enter an alliance with Great Britain and France. In 1912, laws were passed that helped make the lives of workers easier and a system of social insurance was introduced to the country. An English writer who lived in Russia, Maurice Baring, said that Russia had never before prospered so well financially until the reign of Nicholas. Just a few years later, Russian history would change forever. Russia was not doing well during World War I and suffered many losses. In 1917, residents in Petrograd, now known as St. Petersburg, crowded in the streets demanding bread. 240,000 workers would go on strike and life in the city would come to a screeching halt. Nicholas ordered the troops to the capital, but his orders were ignored. On March 2, 1917 while on board a train, Nicholas was forced to abdicate as Tsar. He tried to abdicate in favor of his brother, Grand Duke Michael Alexandrovich, but Michael refused. Nicholas is feeling as if everyone around him had betrayed him, wrote the following passage in his diary, there is betrayal, cowardice, and lies all around me. Three centuries of Romanov rule had come to a lonely end in a train car. In October 1917, Vladimir Lenin and his Bolsheviks would come to power, and the rule of the cruel communist regime of Russia and the soon-to-be-formed Soviet Union would begin. Nicholas and his family became prisoners and their lives would only get harder. In April of 1918, Nicholas, Alexandra, and their daughter Maria were transported to Yekaterinburg. The other Romanov siblings would join their parents and sister not long after. The house the family was transported to had a grim name, the House of Special Purpose. A new set of rules was placed on the family, such as only being able to speak Russian, having their belongings searched, and any money they had was to be taken from them. Around midnight on July 17, 1918, Yakov Yurovsky told the physician of the family, Eugene Botkin, to awake the sleeping family. The family was told to put on their clothes and that they would be moved to a safer location, but this was a lie. The family was placed into a 6M by 5M basement-like room. Two chairs were brought in, one for Alexei and one for Alexandra. The prisoners, consisting of the family and a small group of staff waited in the dark basement. A few minutes later, a small squadron of secret police were brought into the room. Yurovsky then read a proclamation to the crowd, Nikolai Alexandrovich, in view of the fact that your relatives are continuing their attack on Soviet Russia, the Ural Executive Committee has decided to execute you. Nicholas only had the time to say, what, what, before the gunshots began. Alexandra and Olga tried to bless themselves, but were never able to finish their prayers. The corsets of the daughters had some jewels sewn into them, since they were hoping to be sold off for money if the family had to escape or were freed. Due to this, the bullets bounced off the girls due to their homemade bulletproof vests. When the smoke from the gunfire cleared, whimpers could be heard from the victims. The response of the guards was to bayonet the victims and stab them to death. When the bodies were being piled on top of each other, cries from one of the girls would be heard. Peter Ermakov bayonet the girl, then shot her in the head. In less than an hour, an entire family, their staff, and even their pet dog had all been murdered in cold blood. The only survivor of that horrific night was Alexei's little spaniel, named Joy. The bodies of the family, the staff, and the pets were treated with no respect. Sulfuric acid was used to dissolve the bodies and their faces were destroyed. The bodies were then hidden. The body of the teenaged Alexei and one of his sisters were burned in a bonfire, and any remaining bones were smashed. The bodies would not be found for decades and countless pretenders and con artists pretended to be the members of the murdered family, with Anna Anderson being the best known. The bodies of Nicholas and his family were not buried until the 1990s, 
almost a century after their deaths, until after DNA evidence was used to confirm their identities. Boris Yeltsin, then president of Russia said, today is a historic day for Russia. For many years, we kept quiet about this monstrous crime, but the truth has to be spoken. In 2000, the family was recognized as passion bearers in the Russian Orthodox Church. The most well-known depiction of the Romanovs in recent years is the 1997 animated Don Bluth film, Anastasia. During the Once Upon a December song, Nicholas, Alexandra, and four of their five children are seen surrounding the young adult animated version of Anastasia. While the movie for many fed the hope that Anastasia had survived that terrible night, evidence shows all members of the family died in that cold basement on July 18, 1918. Nicholas cared for Russia, but was ill-prepared to govern the country. Russia may have eventually become a constitutional monarchy like the United Kingdom, where Nicholas's cousin George V was king during World War I. If Russia had become a constitutional monarchy, we may have gotten to see the reign of Tsar Alexei II and his children. We may have gotten to see the weddings of the four Romanov daughters. Perhaps the Soviet Union would never have existed. These are all giant what-if questions when it comes to history. For now, we can only wonder what the world would have been like if Nicholas was given proper political training. Thank you everyone for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and if you enjoy both gaming and history, please subscribe to Sweet History Tea and click the bell icon so you are notified whenever I publish a new video. There is a Google Forms poll in the description where viewers can vote on who they want the subject of the next history video to be. Thank you for watching, until next time.